October 21st, 1973, Pella, Iowa. Gabriel Anderson was performing what could be his last exorcism. Despite splashing holy water on the possessed man's face and preaching the gospel of God, Gabriel found no success expelling the demon. As he flipped through his Bible for a new passage, speckles of dust froze in the air, and he felt the tug of a tractor beam. Gabriel's mouth fell agape as a soft yellow beam of light encapsulated him, and his feet lifted from the ground. His thick brown hair stood on end, and his throat became dry as he saw the demon lifting with him. Sweat curved the edge of his brow as he tried to push or kick against the tractor beam and found that only his eyes could move. Gabriel tried to close his eyes, but he could not. Through the haze of yellow emerged milky white eyes framed by black pits. Black and sharp teeth surfaced from behind a gaunt smile. Gabriel's heart sank as he tried to look away, but he could not. His skin crawled as his stomach turned on itself. The world around him faded, and then everything became black. Gabriel thought, Please, God, rescue me from this unholy nightmare. Wake me, wake me now. I am an agent of yours. Please rescue me from this evil. Gabriel lay on his stomach, and the world was sideways as he looked forward. Before him was a cracked pane of glass, and upon it rested splatters of crimson liquid. He sat up, and his muscles ached, and his neck was stiff. Gabriel rubbed at the nape of his neck and felt a hole the size of a pencil eraser. He studied his fingertips and smelled it. Gabriel swallowed the knot which had been forming in his throat and realized he was in a nightmare he could not awake from. As his hands began to shake and pressure built in his ears, the silence of his room became deafening. His ears rang and his eyes widened as his senses returned to him. The air tasted stale and smelled like a mixture of burnt rubber and oil. The walls were made of three foot white tiles and the floor was a single sheet of stainless steel. Gabriel began to shiver as the cold air gripped him. He stood tall and examined his own body. His cassock was still clean and did not show any signs of stress or tears. Beside him in the corner of the room sat a small leathery bag. He opened the bag and study the contents of it. Inside were two bottles of holy water, a Bible, his cross, car keys, wallet, and a watch. Gabriel removed a bottle of holy water and cast his mind back. Gabriel had been dispatched to Keith Fisher's ranch a few days prior. Keith had been acting beside himself. His wife, Carol, had found him brooding and painting pentagrams on the walls of the basement. She found the paintings of pentagrams to be an amusing quirk. That is, until she discovered crimson streaks across the living room floor. The trails began on the front porch and ended in the basement. Carol then understood why her goats kept disappearing. Keith had been gutting them and using them as a sacrifice. Late at night, the coyotes would come and feast on their carcasses. Keith began to mutter to himself that he needed something more. A child. His son, Scott. Once Carol had learned of this, she bound him to the bed. It took three days for Gabriel to arrive, and once he did, he agreed that Keith had become possessed. Where the demon came from didn't matter. It had housed itself in the soul of Keith for a few days now. While Gabriel sat in his cell, 
He tried to remember if Scott was abducted. He stood up and approached the cracked pane of glass. Before him were rooms like his own. Silver floor, three white walls, and a glass pane facing the corridor. A thin haze of dust clung to the air, and the room closest to his was different. Where a glass pane should have been was nothing, and in front of the cell glittered the remains of shattered glass. Something had broken out of its prison. The lights above were dim and bathed the hall in a soft blue glow. A grating in the floor split the hall in two, and on each side were pipes which snaked off to places unknown. Rectangular lights, which were 15 feet in length, illuminated the dark corridor. Between each light was an air vent. The breeze pushed from these vents was silent and did little to eliminate the foul odor of this mechanical labyrinth. Machinery hummed from locations unknown. Aside from the subtle blowing of air from the vents, the hall was silent. Gabriel knew the demon was responsible for the shattered glass. He surmised that it was also responsible for his cracked cell wall. Gabriel traced the glass with his fingertips, and it felt unstable and sharp. He pushed against a piece of glass near the top, and the split snaked downward. The sound of cracking ice rang in his ears as the split grew. He stepped away from the wall as the glass popped, and the split completed its descent to the floor. A good push or kick would knock the glass out, but he wasn't too certain. He removed his cassock and wrapped his foot with it. Gabriel leaned back and kicked the glass pane. It fell into the hall and shattered upon impact. Gabriel shrank back into his cell and feared his abductors heard the crash. His hands trembled as he searched for his bag for a cross. Once found, he gripped it tight and held it against his chest. He whispered a silent prayer as he scooted to the back of his prison. An epiphany had occurred. There was nothing between him and his captors, nor the demon he believed was hunting him. Sweat formed at the edge of his hairline, and he felt the urge to vomit as he choked on the cold, stale air. Gabriel whispered, God put me here for a reason. Find Scott, go find Scott. He sighed and continued. I hope to God he is not here. His eyes opened and he summoned the courage to pass through the opening. As he stepped into the hall, glass crunched beneath his feet and the thick odor of machinery pressed upon him. As he looked to his right, he noticed a cell beside his own, and more cells following in succession. The thought of Scott, a ten-year-old boy, whimpering, afraid and crying in a prison like his own jolted him back to reality. Gabriel stepped closer to the middle of the corridor. He investigated each cell. The hall he was in seemed larger now, and it stretched in both directions without an end in sight. Prison cell after prison cell presented themselves. Creatures in them, but Gabriel paid no attention to that. His focus was Scott. The scent of burnt rubber persisted as the hum of machinery became louder. Where he came from was quiet in comparison, but this did not discourage Gabriel. He scanned the cells, hoping against hope that Scott would not be here that he would have been left behind at the farmhouse. Two cells down from his own, he saw a small boy lying on the floor in a fetal position. His heart skipped as fear drove him closer to the cell. As he approached, he shrieked as his heart sank once he found Scott lying on the floor. Gabriel rushed to the glass and knocked on it. His brow sunk in worry as he hoped Scott was still alive. The boy shivered on the cold floor, and Gabriel pitied him as he grit his teeth and knocked on the glass harder, urging the ten-year-old boy to get up and notice him. Scott craned his head toward Gabriel, and his stare was cold and vacant. Scott seemed to be in a state of shock, 
and Gabriel shifted his gaze from Scott to the room, to the corridor, to anywhere his eyes wandered. There must be an escape. As sweat beaded upon his back and his hands trembled, Gabriel thought how to free Scott from the cell. Scott stepped away from the glass and his face contorted into unwavering terror as he noticed that he too had been abducted. The nightmare he felt he was in became all-consuming. He rushed to the glass and beat against it with his fist, but not a sound broke the silence. Scott screamed as his eyes turned to the innards of his own cell. Gabriel noticed an air vent and pointed at it hastily but failed to capture Scott's attention. He waved his hands and asked Scott to calm down. He knew his words couldn't penetrate the glass, but he spoke anyway. Scott returned to beating at the glass until his fist couldn't take the punishment anymore. He had exhausted himself and heaved while standing face to face with Gabriel. Scott realized what Gabriel was trying to communicate, climbed through the air vent in the back corner of the room. He examined the air vent Gabriel pointed at and guessed that he could fit through it. It seemed large enough to fit him, but not much larger than that. Scott surveyed his cell for something he could stand on or use to open the vents. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Gabriel examined the other cells and saw that they did not contain anything smaller than a grown man. Each cell housed a different creature. Some had four legs while others had two. Many resembled humans in their anatomy while others were too difficult to describe. He returned his attention to Scott and noticed him trying to jump up the cell wall. The air vent remained out of reach, but that didn't matter. He tried again, this time jumping from one wall in the corner to the other, and his fingertips grazed the metal air vent. Scott took a deep breath in and jumped up the corner and punched the air vent. The metal grating bent against his fist, and for a brief moment, Scott felt a glimmer of hope. He smirked as he studied the air vent and sprinted up the wall. He punched again and broke the metal grating. He jumped once more and grabbed the broken metal slat and pulled the grating off. It fell and clattered against the floor. Scott turned toward Gabriel and then returned his focus to the air vent. He sprang up the wall and entered the cold, dark vent. And once there... He found himself in a metal maze void of light. Gabriel smiled as he watched Scott disappear into the air vent. The sounds of Scott clanking around interrupted the silence. He guided Scott with his whispers as to not arouse attention and direct him to the air vent above his own head. As Gabriel stared into the black void in the air vent, he listened as Scott drew closer. Scott whispered, Gabe, Gabriel, Gabe, as his head filled the black void in which Gabriel stared. Scott smiled and looked down into the corridor. Gabriel said, how long were you asleep? Scott rubbed his eyes as he peered from behind the metal grating. He said, I, I don't know. It was me, you, and dad. Scott's face sank as he said, is dad better now? Is the demon gone? Gabriel took a deep breath and exhaled. He blinked hard for a few seconds and tried to scrub the image of Keith from his mind. He bit his bottom lip as he frowned and did not answer. Instead, he looked down the hall because the distinct sound of footsteps caught his attention. He urged Scott to hide deeper in the air vent as he searched for a place to hide. The corridor was dim, and as the footsteps came closer, Gabriel couldn't find a decent hiding spot. There were pathways which led to locations unknown. He had to confuse these pathways with empty cells because they looked similar. He ran in the opposite direction of the footsteps. Gabriel found refuge about 15 paces down from where he was 
and peered from the pathway's bend. The hall in which he hid was far away from his former prison and in a pocket of shadows. Standing in front of his old cell was a gray-skinned creature with bulbous black eyes. Its head seemed too large for its short body and its skin was smooth and waxy. The alien examined the broken cell. It produced a holographic sheet from its wrist and typed against it. Gabriel assumed the alien was cataloging the broken cell. Gabriel remained concealed by the shadows and out of sight. The alien surveyed the cell beside Gabriel's and documented its findings. Gabriel glanced at the air vent where he assumed Scott was hiding and prayed that he did not move. He scanned the alien's body. It was thin, pale, and there weren't any weapons. Gabriel doubted that they walk among their ship unarmed. However, he did consider that they could be blinded by their own hubris. They were interdimensional travelers. What had they to fear? The small creature cataloged a few more details and collected a few pieces of shattered glass. Perhaps to study. Atop its cart were pieces of technology. Something resembling a laptop, a tablet, camera, and something which projected a hologram. It poked at the hologram and searched for something written in a foreign language. Pictures of something unrecognizable appeared on the hologram. Gabriel glanced at the alien and then returned to the shadows. The alien collected more samples and took pictures of the broken cell before it put everything away. It grabbed the cart and pushed it into another hall. Gabriel waited until the footsteps diminished before removing himself from his hiding spot. Gabriel studied the air vent as a child crawled to the opening, and once there, he gestured for Scott to break out and come down. The boy beat his fist against the metal slats until they broke and he removed the metal grating. Scott hung his head outside of the air vent and looked down. Gabriel extended his arms and prepared to catch him. Scott closed his eyes and allowed himself to fall from the air vent. Air whooshed past him as he fell into Gabriel's arms. A sense of relief washed over him as he was set to the floor. Scott felt a rush of excitement and hope now that he was with someone he knew. But Gabriel did not feel the same. The image of Scott's father, Keith, flashed in his mind and what he had become became the focal point of his thoughts. A demon, an entity bound for evil, was loose in this ship, and they were in the company of hostile aliens. He wondered why his beloved god would allow a ten-year-old boy, whose innocence was still intact, be placed here. He chewed on the thought as he studied Scott's bushy brown hair and his worried expression. Gabriel said, I don't know how we're going to get out of this, but I trust God will guide us through this. I did not see any weapons on that thing, but I doubt they're walking around unarmed. I don't want to find out either way. Scott stood on the balls of his feet and teetered forward. He said, What about my dad? Is he all better now? Scott's eyes flickered with hope as he searched for something he could not find. Something, anything that indicated his father was well. His bottom lip curled as his eyebrows furrowed. Gabriel said nothing. Scott said, did, did you save him? Gabriel ignored the question once again and took Scott by the hand. Together they walked past cell after cell after prisoner after cell. Creatures he did not recognize occupied them, and while some were hideous, others resembled humanoid-like creatures. Their gaze was fixed, cold, and without expression. Gabriel could only guess as to what they were thinking and what they felt. He knew that there was nothing they could do to help them, and without knowing their intentions, Helping them may not actually be wise. 
Gabriel wondered if any of these creatures were intended for experiments or if they were captives stowed away like cattle on a ranch for food. He purged the thought and glanced at Scott. His eyes said more than words ever could. Bags hung beneath Scott's eyes and his skin was pale. Furrowed brows and a frown remained unchanged as he and Gabriel approached the end of the corridor. Gabriel looked to his left and then his right. Both pathways were empty halls which led to other halls and bends. Pipes, old and grimy, were fastened to the ceiling. Yellow and blue wiring, marred by grease and age, were visible just above the pipes. Lights, dim and blue, illuminated small sections of the path laid out before them, and the air vents passed along the foul odor of oil and machinery. Beneath their feet was a metal grating, and below that were more pipes, wiring, and a two-foot trench. The walls were worn and tiled with stainless steel. Its shine has been hidden by decades of dirt and grime. Gabriel tasted the stale air and shuddered. He looked down the path to his right and saw that it ended at a cross section about 20 paces down. He turned his focus away from the path and looked in the opposite direction. It yawned onward into a slight haze and fog. Gabriel led them down the narrow path, large enough for three people to walk side by side. As Gabriel turned right, he saw something small and gray lying on the floor. He examined it and noticed it was the head of an alien, cleanly bit off at the neck. He lurched away from the head and crimson splatters spread across the pipes above. A few droplets of red liquid fell from the wiring they once clung to. Walls, streaked with crimson and smeared with dirt, caught Gabriel's attention. Bits of flesh hung on the grates, resembling curtains, and they hung no less than an inch apart, swaying against the breeze. Gabriel's mind froze as he absorbed the scene he was in and wondered where the rest of the alien's body was. All that remained was its head and flayed skin. Scott looked at the alien's head and said, did, did my dad do this? Where are we? His stomach sank as he began to quiver. Gabriel studied the head of the alien and ignored Scott's question. He looked in all directions for the path from which they came, but crimson streaks were all he found. They led deeper into the hall and around a corner. Scott tugged at Gabriel's side and pleaded for his attention. Scott said, Is my daddy doing this? Gabriel looked past the boy and closed his eyes. The answer which screamed in his head could not be silenced. Gabriel thought, Yes, your dad did this. But he could never tell the truth. He rested his hand on Scott's shoulder and pulled his attention from the scene behind them. Gabriel closed his eyes and pressed his tongue against the roof of his mouth. It was dry and he hesitated as he said, It's the demon. He heaved and then continued, Not your dad. The demon. I didn't have enough time to save your dad, but soon I will be able to. Scott blinked hard a few times and gagged as he pressed his hands together and leaned away from Gabriel. The smell of rot and the idea that his father could be the culprit behind this gruesome act caused his stomach to turn. He felt vomit royal in the back of his throat as his skin ran cold, and the world seemed to shrink around him. An indescribable pressure manifested in his ears. And for a moment, he thought he could feel it, the heat of his skin, the coldness of the air, the tension prickling the nape of his neck. Scott leaned forward and said, How? Look what the demon did to that alien. He wants to do that to me. Save my dad. Gabriel noticed Scott begin to wobble. He scooped the boy into his arms and held him. 
Gabriel said, listen to me, trust in God and he will deliver us from this place. Please, Scott, listen to me. The three of us will get through this. We will, I promise. Scott pulled away from Gabriel's embrace and began to walk down the hall. Scott pointed at the crimson streaks as he followed them. He paused and said, How? Gabriel caught up to the boy, and together they walked aimlessly through the hallway, turning left or right at random, only to push deeper into the maze in which they were lost. Minutes of searching for an exit became hours of discovering different halls and doors and cells, and though they were different, Gabriel felt they were walking in circles. Everything looked the same. They traversed the vast ship from one narrow corridor into another and found little. The hum and scent of machinery no longer gripped their senses, and upon further exploration, the duo followed random paths. They approached what appeared to be a dead end. Gabriel couldn't remember the turns he took to end up where he was, but as for now, they stood at the end of a long, narrow hall. A heavy metal door stood between them and a room unknown. At waist height, there was a metal turn wheel. He turned it and the door unlocked. Gabriel pushed upon the door and they found themselves at the edge of a vast hangar. The ceiling hung high. Pipes, large and dirty, ran parallel to each other in a single direction. Black cables draped slightly low and swayed against the breath of the air vents. Dirt had collected to such a point that it took the shape and appearance of rust. Lights, suspended three feet from the ceiling, buzzed and illuminated the hangar in a dim orange glow. Three walls, tiled and forgotten, reflect soft glimmers of light. The floor was a single sheet of solid steel, and the pathways many walked gleamed against the light. Grime had clawed its way up from the floor and at least two feet up the wall. The hangar was wide and fit many ships inside of it. Gabriel studied the ship closest to him. It was the size of a car and could fit four people. The top half of the ship appeared to be made of glass and the bottom was jet black. The shape reminded him of an elongated egg and it floated inside of a dock. There were many more ships like this one, and here they rested. Gabriel approached the ship and didn't see a control panel or anything else indicating how to operate them. He felt that searching for them may be fruitless, as the instructions would not be readable. At the opposite end of the hangar was a vast rectangular opening. A thin veil of transparent blue light stood between the hangar and open space. Once he reached the end of the hangar, he investigated the endless void of space beyond the blue force field. There, he saw an ocean of galaxies which punctured the blackness. Some were orange, others were blue, and many were white or red. Gabriel's faith faltered as he stood before the splendor of the universe and felt something terrible pull at his heart. He thought, did God really make all of this? He tried to count the galaxies he could see, but failed to do so. There were too many. Each of them had billions of planets, with millions of creatures for at least a few million of those planets. He could see the galaxies in which they lived, but they could not see him. He wondered if this is how God felt whenever it viewed its creations. His head swirled as he wobbled to one side and fell over. Scott pulled at his arm and quietly pointed toward the west part of the hangar. Gabriel followed the direction of Scott's finger and found that the demon was feasting in the distance. The gray arm of an alien flopped from side to side as the demon consumed it. Shadows encompassed the demon as it remained hunched over its kill and it lapped up the skin of the alien. The eyes of the lifeless alien gazed into Gabriel's, and for a moment, he pitied his abductors. Scott noticed his father feasting on the alien. 
His mouth fell agape as he felt his skin crawl. While his heart sank and the world faded away, he tried to remember how to breathe. He knew that a demon had taken possession of his father, but it was still his father's face he saw. Keith's skin had split and it had started to drape onto his bones and his skull. His skin looked more like curtains than flesh. His hair was still the same as was his eyes, but Scott knew that wasn't his father. As Keith lifted his head, his eyes fell upon Scott, the flesh of the alien draped from his mouth. Shadows inched out of the pores of his skin and eyes and ears and engulfed him entirely. He heaved as he became no more than a black void. He shirked away from his catch. The shadows collapsed inward on themselves and then retreated to the hangar wall. Gabriel grabbed Scott by the shoulder, and as his hand trembled, he pushed him toward the hangar exit. As they retreated, the shadows spread themselves thin and wove through the air, reminiscent of a sea serpent gliding through water. As they left the hangar, Scott pushed against Gabriel. He shrieked, that's my dad, save him. You're an exorcist. Gabriel clutched the cross against his chest and looked at the slithering shadows fast approaching. He glanced at Scott and returned his attention to the coming threat. Gabriel shuffled his feet backward and grabbed Scott by the waist. He pulled at the child and swung him over his shoulder. Scott kicked and punched as he screamed. Let me go, that's my dad, save him. Gabriel couldn't bear the thought and rather ran as fast as he could. Once he had made it deeper into the corridor, the serpent shadows stretched beyond every corner and bend. As they approached, a single hand emerged at its end closest to them, and it reached for Scott. Nails, sharp and black, smelled like sulfur. Gabriel stumbled and Scott fell upon him. The fingers of the hand extended from the palm, cracking and popping with every inch they grew. Gabriel scooted back and held Scott close to his chest. The nails grew longer, and their ends became like needles. Gabriel reached into his pocket for a bottle of holy water and unfastened it. He splashed it onto the hand and it did nothing. Whatever hope he had to cure Keith had diminished. He realized the only people he can save are himself and Scott. Gabriel whispered, See, boy... It isn't going to work. Now let's go. That is not your dad. That is a monster. Scott cried as he rose to his feet and felt the brush of nails against his shirt. Shadows climbed from the nails and prickled his skin. He cowered because it felt as though cold spiders with needle-like legs were overtaking him. The shadows groped through the air and up his arm. Scott tried to run, but his legs froze as the shadows overtook him. From the center of mass of darkness emerged two bulbous bloodshot eyes and a mouth bearing sharpened teeth. The skull of this creature pressed itself against a thin sheet of Keith's face, and it stretched as it closed in for Scott. The skull and its eyes, which hid within, passed from one eye socket of Keith's face the other. Gabriel ripped the cross from his chest and smashed it into the creature's skull, and it retreated for a moment brief enough for them to make their escape. He scooped up Scott and together they ran through the corridor. As they ran, a loud thud broke the pitter-patter of their running. The demon had started to beat the walls in, and the banging grew in volume. The creature was drawing closer. As they fled, they entered a vast hall similar to the hallway which housed their cells. Gabriel picked a random pathway and followed until he heard something he had never heard before. A loud gurgling sound screeched, and it was followed by a series of clicks. The thudding stopped, and he peeked around the corner to see a gray-skinned alien punching at the demon. Its efforts were in vain, for once the shadows consumed it, the alien's limbs fell limp and breathed no more. Gabriel clutched his cross 
and felt disgust welling up in his stomach. The demon began to feed. Gabriel and Scott turned round and fled deep into the hall. As they ran, the lights which guided them faded to a dim yellow. And then, nothing at all. Gabriel froze and stared into the distance. His hands trembled as his skin ran cold. Scott stood beside him and grabbed his hand. Terror had claimed them both, but Gabriel would not allow his fear to surface. He grabbed Scott by the wrist and led him deeper into the unknown. Lights, pale and yellow, flashed beneath the metal grating they ran upon. Suddenly, a low hum broke the rhythm of their footsteps, and it reminded Gabriel of a muffled, rhythmic thud. The aliens were now completely aware of the threat stalking their crew and sounded the alarm. Together, they ran until their legs ached and their lungs pleaded for air. Gabriel heaved as he slumped against the cold steel wall, as did Scott. The strength they once possessed had now waned. Their bodies ached and their legs throbbed. Scott rubbed his thighs, hoping to massage the pain away, but it persisted. He fell to his knees and looked at the metal grating they stood upon. Cables and pipes stretched beyond what he could see, and he felt they were lost in a labyrinth. Scott pleaded for an escape, to wake up, and for a glimmer of hope this was just a nightmare. He found no solace as he broke upon the floor. Gabriel slumped beside him and wrapped him up in his embrace. He stroked Scott's hair and then patted him on the back. Gabriel said, there, there. We'll get through this. God will carry us through this. Scott pushed away from Gabriel and bellowed, No, we're not. Those aliens want to kill us, and so does my dad. Gabriel interrupted, That is not your dad. That thing is not your dad. It never was, it never will be. Scott, please, please calm down. We're not going to survive this if you panic. A deep and uncomfortable silence was shared between the two. Gabriel didn't know how to reconcile the grave truth before him, and Scott could not fathom that his father was truly gone. As they sat together, both quiet yet in different worlds of thought, they were in unbridled turmoil. God could not save them, and Scott knew it, and Gabriel remained too hopeful to admit it. Gabriel squeezed Scott tight and swallowed the knot which had been forming in his throat. His mouth was dry and he trembled as he held Scott. Strength could not be summoned. He wondered where his God was and why he was placed here. A tear streaked down his cheek and carved its way through the dirt on his face. He pressed his head back and looked at the ceiling. As they sat, a loud crash echoed from an unknown location down the hall. He held on to Scott, and Scott squeezed back. The bang grew in volume and intensity, and with it, the gurgling and clicking sounds of aliens communicating returned. He closed his eyes, and so did Scott. He listened as the aliens' bones popped and their flesh tore. Gabriel knew what was happening and that a fight had ensued. These gray-skinned aliens, masters of the universe, were at the mercy of a mythological entity. A demon, something conjured up by men of old for no other reason than to give the underworld a terrifying presence. Gabriel squeezed his cross as the bangs came closer, louder, and suddenly something resembling gunfire ensued. His eyes peeled open and there were flashes of white light coming from around the corner. Scott opened his eyes and tried to look, but Gabriel stopped him. He covered Scott's eyes with his palm and pressed his head into his own chest. Gabriel stared into the empty space and heard the scream of a grown man. The demon had been injured and it bellowed in agony. Gabriel's eyes shifted in the darkness as a drone buzzed down the hall in front of them, 
fired two more blasts of white light, and then more agonizing screams. Gabriel held on to Scott tighter, as now Scott knew what was happening. He said, they're killing my dad. Scott pushed Gabriel and tried to stand up. Gabriel clutched Scott's leg hard, but not hard enough. Scott slipped out of his captor's grip and ran toward the drone, firing beams of light at his father. His mouth fell open as he saw the horror unfolding before him. The demon had receded somewhere inside of Keith, and now all that remained was a broken man writhing on the floor. Surrounding him were four drones, each blasting him with a laser. For each blast, a new hole had been cut into his skin. Gabriel rushed from behind and scooped up Scott. He knew Scott was ready to break the drones, or at least going to attack them. Gabriel sprinted down the hall with Scott on his shoulder, and as he did so, the demon returned. It reached for the drones and encompassed them in shadows. Gabriel turned around and saw the aliens concede and begin to flee. The drones which seemed to keep it under control were crushed by an unknown force and fell to the floor. Gabriel sprinted hard as the loud bangs returned. The deep breaths of the demon echoed through the hall, but Gabriel could not see it. Now the halls were darker and dimly lit. He hadn't the faintest clue about the demon's whereabouts, only that he could hear it banging. He pressed on anyway as he carried the boy deeper, following a random path around many bends and corners until they reached a spot resembling a reactor room. The room itself was quite large and there were crimson streaks reflecting what little light shone itself. Gabriel entered the room and laid Scott down on the floor. The boy covered his face with his palms and began to cry. He said, my dad's not going to heaven. Why didn't you save him? Gabriel, worn thin and tired, snapped. Would you shut up about your dad? I'm trying to keep you alive, so that way you can at least return home to your mother. Scott, your dad is finished. Don't you get it? We're going to have to destroy him if we're going to survive this. Scott's whimpers became an uncontrollable sob. He knew that what Gabriel said was the truth, and there were only two outcomes. Neither of them were appealing. Gabriel's conviction faltered as he realized he had just scolded a ten-year-old boy who was grieving the possible loss of his father. He sat beside him and took his hand. Gabriel whispered, Look, I'm sorry. I don't know what to do in this situation. I was certain we'd somehow be saved by now, but I think we have come to a point where we must save ourselves. I'm sorry for yelling at you. I'm sorry. Scott's face, flushed with defeat and a terrible gloom, was expressed with a frown and silence. As the air felt thick with desperation, Gabriel felt something twist inside his stomach. Guilt, shame, regret. Gabriel turned away from the boy and pressed his fingertips against the bridge of his nose. He wondered if there was any chance he could somehow escape the ship, and if so, how they could return home. Against doubt and tribulation, he pressed his hands together and prayed. He whispered, Dear Lord Almighty, Heavenly Father, I ask for your assistance in this perilous time. I have been a faithful servant for decades, and now I am faced with no other option but to request your absolute divine strength. Please deliver us from this place and into the arms of our homes, or at the very least, far away from this alien craft. We do not belong here and we do not know why you have placed us here. Please save us from this prolonged torture. Thank you, amen. Gabriel peeled his eyes open and saw that he and Scott were still stuck in the spacecraft. He waited, expecting some kind of miracle. 
perhaps a portal to open, or for God itself to arrive in a ball of white light. No such comfort came, because as he waited, the ship still hummed and the scent of burnt rubber remained in the air. A magic portal and a being which could whisk them away to safety did not, nor could ever, manifest itself for him. Gabriel began to pout as he looked forward at the wall. He waited for at least a rejection of his prayer, but didn't even get that. He felt forsaken by the God he admired and served. He begged for a miracle until he, too, began to weep. Together, Gabriel and Scott silently shed their tears for nearly an hour until they heard something gasping for breath behind them. Gabriel turned around and saw what appeared to be a gray-skinned alien hunched against the wall. It had a large gash beneath its ribs, and a chunk of its neck had been bitten out. Its black eyes remained fixed on Gabriel, and for a moment, it reached for them. As Gabriel studied the alien, it fidgeted, and the crimson pool it sat in grew in width. The alien was nearing its end. It reached for Gabriel's hand once more, but this time, it failed to keep it suspended in the air. Gabriel tried to remember if he saw the alien sneak in behind them, and was reminded of the crimson splayed across the wall. He assumed the alien had been there all along, slowly fading because of its wounds. After contemplating the situation, he saw there was no reason to fear the alien. If the creature wanted them gone, it would have been rid of them long ago. Since the alien is on the threshold of the afterlife, it seemed unlikely it would have the strength to fight back. While keeping this in mind, Gabriel reached for the alien, and the alien lifted its hand into the air. Three gray fingers and a thumb reached for him. Gabriel grabbed the alien's hand, and he felt part of himself disconnect from this world. His mind had been taken to another place, a location where the galaxies were charted like a map of stars, and somehow he knew exactly where Earth was. 72,000 light years away. Gabriel felt the fingers of whatever was guiding him pull him in a new direction, towards a thought. He thought God was speaking to him through the alien. His mouth fell agape as the truth unfolded before him. The alien is trying to help. He resisted no more and took this as a sign from his beloved God. The layout of the ship imprinted upon his mind, and the thoughts themselves began to blur. The alien's demise was imminent and was a few moments away. Gabriel clung on and squeezed the alien's hand tighter. The creature thought of the ship's layout and of a few places that could aid their escape. Three more hangars, one facing each side of the ship, north, west, east, south, 1,000 escape pods, an alien crew of 700, now 699, now 680. They have abandoned their cause and are returning home. Flee, flee now, the thought reverberated in Gabriel's mind. Flee, he felt his prayers had been answered, even though the answer to his prayers was a dying alien who was behind them before he uttered a single word of his prayer. Gabriel tried to release the alien so that he could run, but the creature clung on. Don't leave me, whispered in his head. Don't leave me alone. Gabriel studied the alien and held onto its hand. He pitied it because he could feel its fear of the unknown. He knew that it did not want to die alone, but what else could Gabriel do except wait? The connection between him and the alien began to fade. Gabriel leaned in closer to examine the alien. He felt this being was more human than he had originally thought. As he held on, a few last desperate messages pierced his mind. Temporal chamber, 
a place which will explain everything. He knew the location of this place and how to leave the ship. He sucked in a deep breath of air and felt relieved now that God had returned to being the wind beneath his wings. He released the alien's hand and looked at Scott. He said, God spoke to me through this creature. I've been given a revelation. There is a way off this ship, and there are escape pods which will deliver us to where we need to go. This ship is being evacuated, so we must hurry. But first, I must know the truth about God. The temporal chamber will give me access to all the known knowledge in the universe. Scott, come with me. Scott remained firm in his stance and said, That alien was talking to me in my head, too. He used your energy to communicate. He's dying. Dying. Gabriel, he's dying, and he doesn't want us to leave him alone. I don't think what you heard or saw was a message from God. It came from the alien. It's trying to help us. Scott stepped away from Gabriel and continued, I'm not leaving until you cure my dad. If you believe in God and faith, you must save my dad. Gabriel found himself near the exit of the room. He hadn't realized he had nearly stepped out of it. Once he awoke to himself, he questioned if he was about to abandon Scott or if he had become so focused on escape that leaving Scott behind was an oversight. He drew his attention to the alien and noticed Scott kneeling beside it. Scott said, He's dying. Can you say a prayer for him so he will go to heaven, please? Gabriel scanned the limp alien's body. He replied, Only we can go to heaven. Scott, we need to keep moving because that demon is out there. We need to get off this ship. Scott said, My dad, my dad is out there. He needs our help. He needs you to exercise that demon out of him. Gabriel, you're an exorcist. That is your job as an exorcist. Scott looked at the alien. Its breaths had become shallow and far apart. Gabriel extended his hand and replied, I'm, I'm sorry, but we need to go. I cannot save your dad. It's either us or him, and trust me, that demon wants you more than anything on this ship. These aliens cannot control it with their technology, and I've already thrown holy water on it and smashed a cross into its skull. If we can do all of those things and still not kill it, why do you think we could do something else and somehow save your dad? Gabriel released a drowned out sigh and said, I'm sorry, boy, but you know I've tried everything. We're just in a different world now, and what worked at home just isn't working here. The alien's head dropped to one side, and Scott felt it tug against him. Scott looked at the creature and then at Gabriel. The alien's hand slipped out of Scott's and fell to the ground. In that moment, Scott studied Gabriel. He had thought Gabriel was a man of astute morals and assumed he viewed all beings as children of God. Surely, these gray-skinned creatures were God's creation and deserved the same rights as he did. And if the aliens were creatures of God, so were demons. Scott felt queasy as he thought about it and what's right and wrong. He felt an ugly sense of disgust and even hatred for him. There he was, the only man who could save his father, and yet he chose not to. Scott could not, nor would he try to understand Gabriel's reasoning. Scott felt there had to be a way to rescue his father, although they both stood still. 
Scott felt the distance between them grow. Gabriel had abandoned the hope that Keith can be saved from the demon and paid his attention to escaping the ship while Scott clung to the hope that his father can be cured. Now, as they stand together at these proverbial crossroads, both of them are torn. For Scott to move forward with Gabriel would suggest that he must abandon his father. For Gabriel to try one last time to cure Keith could result in the death of them both. They stared at each other, and Gabriel knew that he had to make and commit to a decision. Scott was far too young to see his father for what he had become. And Gabriel knew that the vision Scott held for the future was tainted by the wishful thinking of a child. He lunged for Scott and scooped him up over his shoulder. Scott punched Gabriel's back as he was lifted. Gabriel said, Forgive me, but this is what we have to do. Scott kicked and tried to knee Gabriel in the throat to no avail. Gabriel left the reactor room and the deceased alien. He carried Scott down the dimly lit corridor and followed the map which had been imprinted into his mind. He walked with determination to the temporal chamber and eventually Scott no longer fought back. Tears fell from his eyes as he admitted defeat and yet he still clung to hope. There had to be a way to save his father. Together they arrived at the temporal chamber. The room was vast and inside of it were six circular platforms a foot from the floor. A thin film of blue light encased the circles and reached eight feet in height. Though Gabriel had never been here before, he knew what these machines were for. Each platform is a temporal time displacement field where users can do one of many things. Anyone who steps inside of the field can re-experience any memory they've ever encountered and change it. In doing this, one can enter a state of suspended animation and delve into their own mind and explore the depths of their desires. Something else they can do is traverse the threads of the universe and peer beyond the veil. See moments of time which had been captured and stored in the temporal archive. There, any being can bear witness to any event on any planet, in any dimension, so long as that information is stored in the temporal archive. Gabriel studied the platforms and knew that this was it. Now, he will learn of his esteemed god and its origins. Anyone who steps on the platform submits the entirety of their memories, and Gabriel knew that this is how the Temporal Archive grew. For millions of years, this species has collected enough information to simulate a universe in the mind, and to do it for eternity. For now, Gabriel has one mission, to glimpse into heaven and see what lies beyond. Driven by the lust of his curiosity, he stepped onto the platform and felt every memory, emotion, and experience be copied and ripped from him. His mind ached as it was assaulted by technology unknown, and soon Gabriel found himself before two ants in combat. One ant was white and glimmered, and the other ant was black and concealed in shadows. They pressed upon each other, desperate to destroy the other. Gabriel studied them and asked to see heaven. His answer was the two ants, two insects in constant battle. Gabriel asked once more to no avail. Behind each ant stood a vast army, brooding, taking more than it needed. Each side demands blood and conquest. If Gabriel were blind and could only hear them, he wouldn't know there were two groups of insects, only that there were insects. Creatures tucked away in its own dimension, leading into his own. Parasites, 
interdimensional entities fighting for their own survival, jesters and kings and queens of their own like, embattled in a cosmic thread seated next to his own. Gabriel's brows lifted as he realized what the answer to his question was. He stepped off the temporal platform and collapsed on the floor. His eyes drifted upward in a haze as he watched Scott float in the temporal field next to his own. Without knowing, Scott delved into the bottomless pit of his greatest desire. Here, his heart stopped, his brain ceased, and he entered a state of suspended animation. Scott lifted from the platform and he was transported to the deepest part of his mind. His world became warm, and he was returned to the farm from which he was abducted. He stood at a barn, the scent of hay, and the sound of a trotting cow broke him into his new reality. For a moment, he felt like it was a dream, so he pinched himself. It hurt. His nails broke the skin, but here he was free. His father walked from around the bend and waved. He said, Mom's working up a sweat trimming those horse hooves, so you'd best get on and help her. Scott smiled and ran into his father's legs. He wrapped him up with his arms and held tight. Scott cried as he held his dad. Gabriel became aware and noticed Scott had placed himself on a temporal platform. His stomach sank because he knew that if he removed Scott from the platform, or if the ship were to lose power, Scott would die. His brain is off, and so is his heart. In ways he cannot explain, the temporal field is keeping him alive in suspended animation. Gabriel took a deep breath in and pushed the thought of the demon removing him from the field out of his mind. If the demon did that, Scott would perish instantly. Under normal circumstances, someone would monitor the temporal fields and can override the experience of another for safety reasons, in addition to the individual being aware of what they're experiencing much like Gabriel knowing how to get into and out of the temporal field. Someone like Scott, he simply doesn't know that he's dreaming. And because of that, he will not wake up, even if Gabriel begged him to. As Scott floated in the air, he saw his mother and felt the dust of the barn blow against his skin. The sun felt warm, and as he took his first step, the thin straws of hay crunched beneath his feet. His mother, Carol, beamed as he looked at her from beyond his father's shoulder. He did not want to let go, but felt torn between his mother and father. He released his father and dashed for Carol. He dove into her arms, and she wrangled him into her loving embrace. She pressed her lips against his forehead and rubbed his back. She said, I'm done with the horse for now, and I got a few minutes before I have to go collect the eggs. Scott bit his bottom lip and teetered forward as he said, Can, can I get them with you? Carol smiled and the sun glowed against the silhouette of her hair. Scott saw her toothy smile and felt a rush of joy skip through his heart. She said, Chores, Keith, what's wrong with our boy? He wants to do chores today. Scott smiled, and together, the three of them left the barn and approached the chicken coop. Gabriel closed his eyes and stood still for a moment. He thought of Scott trapped in the temporal displacement field, and that if anything removes him from it, he will perish. He reminded himself that it doesn't matter if it's the demon or an alien or even power failure. His brain activity has been reduced to zero so that the temporal field can do what it needs to do, and his heart has stopped. 
As Gabriel stood in the absolute isolation of his situation, he felt the ground beneath him quake. Far in the distance, a thud and a bang pierced the silence. He opened his eyes and gazed at the doorway. It's coming. For Scott. Gabriel examined the room and surveyed for the control panel. At the opposite end of where he was stood a panel of controls, and upon seeing them, he knew what must be done. Gabriel drew from the well of knowledge that had been given to him and searched for a returned control that would reanimate Scott's organs. Once his organs had been restored, he could then stop the virtual simulation and awaken him. The bangs became louder as a subtle groan filled the halls beyond the doorway. As the demon approached, it shrieked and a sulfurous odor permeated the temporal chamber. Gabriel rushed to the control panel and studied each button and lever. He thanked God for blessing him with this knowledge and pressed the button to activate Scott's organs. The lights which surrounded the temporal field changed from blue to red as Scott's liver came to life, and then so did his lungs, kidneys, and heart. Everything resumed their normal function, and Scott took a deep breath in. As Gabriel stood, searching for the button to awaken Scott, Scott remained trapped in his dream. Scott saw the honey sky above golden fields of wheat. He smelled the scent of flowers and bloom, and marveled at the fireflies which had come out early for the night. As his organs began to resume their function, Scott recognized he was in a dream. The illusion had been shattered, and he remembered the reality which awaited him. He clung to the moment and stared from the chicken coop. He held on to his mother and father as a loud bang punctured his perfect world. The demon had entered the temporal chamber, and his perfect honey sky split to the bottom of the horizon. Tucked within the gash of his split sky was a black void made of nothingness. Splinters spread across the sky like spider webs, and the void which stared back at him grew. Scott glanced at his mother, who didn't notice the sky above splitting and cracking. She collected the eggs, and suddenly, he felt it. Dirt kicked into the air as the ground beneath him quaked. The sound of Gabriel's screams rang in his ears, but Scott held on. He refused to wake up. Gabriel pleaded with Scott to stop resisting, but he couldn't. As the black valleys and the split sky spread farther apart, tiny tendrils fingered across anything that was at the void. They pulled and scratched. The sound of their nails reminded him of nails across a chalkboard. But even still, Scott refused to wake up. He knelt beside his mother and picked up an egg. A second quake knocked the egg out of his hand. It cracked in a black void of empty space and spilled across the ground. Gabriel screamed, pleaded, and begged for Scott to wake up, but not yet. Scott knows that when he wakes up, he will never be able to have this moment again. He stood up and pressed his hands against his pants and looked at his dad. Keith stood tall as a silhouette against the backdrop of the shattered sky. His eyes and teeth had become consumed by the void. Keith said, How are you doing, champ? Scott stepped away from his father and glanced around. The void was spreading, consuming everything. He knew this was it. Another bang followed by a sudden jolt. Scott felt a terrible pain in his right hip and the world around him shattered entirely. Gabriel held Scott in his arms and there he lay, limp and nearly lifeless. He had leapt through the air and crashed into Scott only seconds earlier. Gabriel ran out of the temporal chamber while carrying Scott, and the demon followed, hurling what it could grab. The bangs became deafening as they raced through the halls. As Scott's head flopped around, he awoke to see Gabriel struggling to breathe while sprinting. Scott felt as though he were in a drunken haze. 
The ceiling above him passed by and nothing made sense. He was taken too soon, and because of that, his brain has not fully awoken yet. For a moment, he didn't know he was in danger, only that they were being pursued, only that he was being carried, and heard the sound of Gabriel's feet pounding against the metal grating, and the bangs of the demon in pursuit. As Gabriel struggled to carry Scott through the halls, the distance between him and the demon shrank. The foul odor became unbearable, and the shadows stretched past him farther and faster than he could run. Gabriel thought about abandoning all hope, but knew this was the right decision. He had to press on, if only for this boy. Gabriel took a few sharp turns, and the shadows stretched five feet ahead of him, and ten, and fifteen. The demon's breath curled the hair on his neck, and now he could hear its tongue lapping against its teeth. Gabriel summoned a greater amount of strength than he thought he could. It sprinted hard to a hangar bay. Once there, he turned around a corner and waited for the demon to enter the hangar. It did so and stretched itself outwards, resembling a bat in mid-flight. Keith's skin had become so torn and shredded that by now he was nothing more than a sack of meat attached to a skull. The father Scott wanted to return will never return. Not like this. Gabriel concealed Scott's breathing and slunk back against the door. The demon scanned the hangar and listened for footsteps and heard nothing. It scanned the ships and saw nothing. Gabriel took off his shoes and threw them around the side of the door. He closed his eyes and bit his bottom lip as he hoped the demon would not see them as it passed them. The demon heard the shoes clatter against the wall, and it assumed they had fled. It roared and raced down the hall in search of its prey. Gabriel opened his eyes and located the control panel for the escape pods. He knew the demon would recognize his deception in less than 20 seconds, but that's all he needed. Gabriel whispered, Scott, buddy, I'm going to program these pods and take us back home. Now, come here. Gabriel led Scott to the control board and said, When we fire one of these off, the pod will eject immediately and then sail into space for about 15 minutes. After that, it will triangulate toward Earth and create a wormhole that will drop us off near the moon. Once there, it will teleport you to Earth. You will be transported right outside your house. So don't be scared, okay? Scott nodded. Gabriel continued. If I tell you to push that button, this purple one right here, you push it. It will eject a pod into space and then do nothing. It'll float around in space forever. Understand? Scott nodded. Gabriel programmed pod 10 and pod 9 to return to Earth. The loud bangs returned and Gabriel fidgeted as he watched the demon rip itself into the hangar. He trembled and looked at Scott. Gabriel shouted, Hide! Hide! Now! Scott knelt down behind the control panel, and the demon didn't notice him. Gabriel ran into the tenth pod and shouted, Purple! Purple! Scott realized what was happening. Gabriel was baiting the demon away from him. Gabriel climbed into the pod, and the demon followed. The pod door shut, and crimson began to splatter against the glass. Gabriel pressed his face against the glass and screamed, Purple! 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 Scott stood up and looked over the control panel. He stared at the purple button and looked at his father. Tears erupted from his eyes as he realized Gabriel was right all along. He pushed the purple button and the pod ejected from the ship. As it sailed into the infinite void, Gabriel was reduced to no more than shreds and liquid. 
Scott stood, mortified by what he saw. He dropped to his knees and cried, Dad! He ran his fingers through his hair and screamed at the empty space before him. He wept into his palms until there was nothing, and all that remained was the dull hum of the ship. Scott stood up and pushed the buttons Gabriel instructed him to. He stepped into the pod beside Gabriel's and closed the lid. The pod itself was the size of a car and had three places to sit. No controls, levers, or buttons. Once the lid had been closed, it ejected from the ship and sailed into empty space. Scott looked up and noticed the pinpoints of light from high above and below and all around him. Galaxies and nebulae took shape, and the raw beauty of outer space distracted him from the horrors he had just witnessed. Scott looked in all directions and felt relief as he watched the alien spacecraft move farther away from where he was. The hulking structure resembled an ominous silver metal monstrosity that would soon be swallowed by the void of space. He felt a pull and saw a blue and white vortex open before him and at the other end was Earth. He sailed through the wormhole and arrived beside the moon. As he sat, his body began to tingle and then pain, absolute unbearable pain as his atoms were disassembled and beamed down to Earth. Scott couldn't remember breathing again, only that he just did. He couldn't remember feeling any pain as he was put back together. The brief second between then and now was void of time, much like waking up after a dreamless sleep. He didn't know when the nightmare ended and reality began. All he knew was the cool touch of grass was on his cheek. The birds sang and he was wet. He opened his eyes and looked forward. The world around him was bathed in a gray fog, and he could hear someone walking around about 40 feet away. Scott said, Mom, his throat hurt. Everything hurt. He spread his arms through the grass and reached in the direction of the sounds. Scott bellowed, Mom. He winced in agony, but he was... Relieved to hear his mother gasp. Scott, she dropped a tin pail and ran toward the direction of her son and surveyed the yard. He was just out of her field of vision. Scott pulled himself forward and heaved on the ground. Carol heard his struggles and discovered him at the edge of the cornfield. She ran to his side and scooped him up into her lap. She brushed her hand against his face and began to cry. She said, you're okay, you're okay. I saw them take you and your dad. Scott shook his head and said, no. No, mom. Just me. Carol pressed a hard line between her lips and fought the tears about to come. She knew what Scott meant and allowed her husband's story to end there. She held on to him, and he quivered as he gazed into the gray sky above. Carol cradled his head into her arms and stroked his hair. She whispered, It's okay, Scott. We'll get through this somehow, some way. I'm just glad you're back, and if you never want to talk about this, I understand. I love you, and I am glad you're home. Scott leaned his head back and closed his eyes. He saw nothing, but that's okay, because he knew that this was real. It was all real.
overall I'm pretty happy with the story. I like the way it developed. But I think there are some areas of improvement, but that's something that can be managed later. What I wanted to capture with the story is, um, hmm. so if an exorcist is abducted, what would happen to that exorcist? Would he question his own beliefs with God? What would the demon do? What would the demon do with the aliens? And would the aliens know that they are dealing with a demon? And I also wanted to incorporate uh, where I wanted to communicate that in this universe, what makes up God and what makes up Satan, they're just two interdimensional beings that are fighting for each other. Not fighting for each other, but fighting against each other for resources, kind of like humans fighting other humans. But in, in this universe, uh, they would be pretty much fighting for conquest. And so on one end of the spectrum, you have the people who are aligned with God pushing for God. And then you have the other people who align with Satan pushing for Satan. And I kind of wanted to capture the essence of um, you get to a certain point with technology that you can figure things like that out. You can figure out that there are interdimensional beings. And what I was trying to communicate was that with this alien species, they had figured that out. And for them, they've seen thousands, if not millions, of species that are similar to that. So the idea of a demon getting on their ship, first of all, their hubris set them up for failure because they uh, they didn't think they could ever succumb to that because, you know, what did they have to fear? But in addition to that, things like demons and angels would be no different than, let's say, us going to a zoo and um, seeing the giraffes and then seeing the horses and then going to see the lions. And for the alien species, that's kind of what it was like for them. That's why they didn't care. As for um, more of the personal aspects of the story, I wanted to capture the conflict of Scott wanting his dad to be rescued and saved even though it was even though by the time they saw Keith for the first time Keith was beyond the point of return at that point when they saw him in the hangar he was already too far gone he had pretty much become nothing more than demon at that point but I wanted to capture the conflict of Scott wanting Gabriel, the exorcist, to save his dad, and in spite of everything, I wanted to capture the how confusing it was, because there were points in the story where Scott had the attitude of, well, how are you going to save us? Look at what the demon's doing, and then doing the opposite of, you're an exorcist, you have to save us. And so I was trying to capture the confusion and I'm not sure if it actually came off as a child being confused or if the story had not been structured appropriately and I think that's kind of one of the things where I'm kind of iffy about because I don't know if I have actually achieved the sense for the listener to understand that the kid is confused. I don't know if I conveyed that well enough because when I was hearing it, it sounded like the story structure may have been weak in a few points. So that wasn't my intent. My intent was to capture that Scott was torn. He was confused. He wanted his dad to be saved, but he didn't want to admit that his dad can't be saved. And that was the goal. That's what I was trying to capture. As for other elements of the story, I wanted the spaceship to be something more realistic. So I used, I think, what human beings would be like, where if we get to the point where we can build a spaceship, 
it's not going to look like what it looks like in the movies. I think a lot of it is going to be very nitty and gritty and dirty because a lot of the spaceships and movies and things like that they're really clean and all I'm thinking about are Roombas on the floor and on the ceiling and on the walls but realistically if there's a massive spaceship flying around and there's a crew of I don't know how many aliens on board the likelihood that that ship is gonna be clean is very unlikely especially if that alien spaceship which is very likely, is thousands and thousands of thousands of years old. And so when I'm envisioning a future species traveling through space, I'm imagining that the spaceship is probably older than the human race, and so it would only make sense that it would be dirty and grimy because, you know, how many times if they had to fix a pipe or, you know, something like that, because things like that just really aren't covered in science fiction. It's as though every alien spacecraft operates perfectly and there's never any problems. And because of that, the spacecrafts are always like sparkling clean. I think the, the only exception that I've really seen is the spaceships in Alien. But then again, I believe that those movies were shot with a more realistic experience with a more realistic approach to what humans are actually going to build and what aliens actually might, you know, build. So if you're a new subscriber, thank you for subscribing. I hope that you like the video and I hope you comment. And I kind of want to talk about where I've been because the last video I uploaded was a couple months ago. So this one took me about a month and a half to make maybe closer to a month, but it, it took a while, a week to write it, a week to edit it, and a week to do the recording and pretty much sound design, and now I think I'm on week uh, five because I've also been doing the AI pictures and things like that. But uh, I've been writing a book called Islands Apart. I started writing it back in September and I finished it up in January and I took maybe a month away from YouTube to finish that book and then I took a break because I had written more than 250,000 words and so I felt it was appropriate to take a break and so I took a break but now that that break is over and now that I've published uh, Void the plan moving forward from here is to create a series and then within that series I would have the main story which is like what you just saw void and then the main story would have prelude stories which would be smaller in scope that lead into the main story and so here's an example the next project I'm working on is called uh, Church of Sin. It's about a group of people that do crazy things. I don't want to say too much about it, but I would write the main story and then I would create little stories that would feed into that. So that way it kind of gives you a little bit of a nugget to chew on until the main story comes out. So yeah, that's pretty much what the future holds. So subscribe. I have a Patreon that you can check out. I upload the pictures that I use in the videos. I upload that to my Patreon. You can get them for free. I also have um, downloadable versions of all the stories I do so that way you can download the story and then you can put it on your phone just like you would your music. So that's a really cool thing. but. As for the next project, it's going to be the Church of Sin, and there's going to be a lot of prequel projects that feed into it, so look for those. So make sure you're subscribed so that way you're notified when those stories drop. Now if you would like something else, I have a scary story you might like. It's called Cadaver, and it's about a guy who sold his wife's soul for fortune and fame. If you would like something else, I have also... The Color of Roses, it's a more emotional story about a boy who lost his mother. 
And um, it's about him accepting that and moving on and embracing what life is like after losing her. If you would like something a little more not so scary but not so emotional, I also have a story called The Bubonic God. It's a piece of historical fiction about the Black Death and more particularly about a man named Antonio who is affected by the Black Death. It's set in Siena, Italy, and it's one of my favorite stories. I think you would enjoy it. But as for now, uh, thanks for watching. I hope you've subscribed, comment. Links to everything I mentioned is in the description below. Thank you.